All right, welcome. So this event this evening is um, hopefully you're all in the right place. This is about earthquakes. Um, and we expect this is going to be a very informative and interesting presentation, which should leave many of us with clear action items and information to help us respond better in the face of a major earthquake. We are recording this evening and we are going to put this recording on our website and we'll put that information in the chat for you so you know how to access it. I'd like to start by introducing the members of the Tamil, Tamil Pius Valley NRG Network Steering Committee, which is always a great big mouthful that I'm so excited to get out of my mouth without stumbling. <laughs> I am Pam Keon. I am um, the chair of the steering committee and I am a block captain in the uh, Tennessee Valley NRG. And we have Ted Barone, who is in the Marin Drive NRG. Lee Budish is in the Erica Chamberlain NRG. Fred Silverman is in the Pine Hill East NRG. I think I see Rob Rollins is in the Waterview NRG. Tim Pozar, I see, is in the Marin View NRG. And I'm not sure if he can make it tonight, but the final member of the steering committee is Frank Liebman, who's in the Northern Eastwood NRG. So we really cover a lot of the territory. Um, I would also like to introduce our invaluable partners with Southern Marin Fire Protection District, without whom we absolutely could not do what we do. Tom Welch, um, on my screen is up in the corner. And Tom is the Deputy Chief of Operations and Training for Southern Marin Fire. His almost 30 years of public safety experience have been enormously helpful to us in learning how to most effectively support our community. In addition, I always think his personal experience of losing his own home in the 2017 Tubbs Fire and helping to evacuate his neighbors brings a real life component to our discussions of disaster preparation and response and reinforces the critical importance of our neighbor helping neighbor philosophy. Also for me, up in the top of my screen is Elaine Wilkinson. Elaine is Southern Marin Fire's first neighborhood response coordinator. And we are so delighted to have her. She is um, she has is fairly new to this position and has jumped in with all both feet and both hands to assist all of the areas in Southern Marin for those who already have energies that have started and for those who are just getting on their feet to develop their programs. Um, Elaine is also a member of the Southern Marin CERT Steering Committee and is the co-founder of Tam High's Emergency Preparedness Commission. So we're really thrilled to have you both here. And finally, our, our just fantastic speakers this evening. We're so excited to have them here and so thankful to them for agreeing to come and speak with us this evening. We have Janelle Maffei, we have Bijan Razi, we have Woody Baker Cohn and Kathleen Reese. So before we get into the speaking, just a little background. Um, this event tonight is just one in a series of community forums that have been hosted by the Tamil Pius Valley NRG Network on public safety topics relevant to our community. Prior forums have focused on topics like um, recently we had a sea level rise forum, listening forum with our elected officials. We've had forums on wildfire, on evacuation, and a whole series of topics. The NRG network, um, I mentioned the steering committee members being from different NRGs in Tam Valley. We have a total of 15 NRGs in Tam Valley that serve over 7,500 residents. Our energy program is intended to strengthen our social bonds in order to enhance our resiliency in the face of disaster. And we're really excited that we have almost 90 block captains in Tam Valley. And um, we're looking forward to eventually having over 200 active block captains supporting us. So as far as tonight, um, 
we were talking recently about how for many years, much of the volunteer emergency preparedness work in our community was focused on earthquakes. This was particularly true in the wake of the Loma Prieta earthquake, which most people remember, even if you were not here at the time in 1989, we had a 6.9 earthquake. Um, it resulted in 63 deaths. It left 3,757 people injured and it caused over $5 million in damage. That was not that long ago. And that event caused um, us to be very focused on earthquake, to take all these steps to try and prepare for it. And then in recent years, something else has happened, wildfires. Wildfires have become a real concern in recent years. And our, our thinking and our efforts as volunteers has really focused to the conversation about wildfire and particularly the whole idea of how to minimize risk and how to get out of danger. Um, but in the meantime, as we've been putting our attention on wildfire, uh, the risk of earthquake hasn't gone away and it hasn't gotten better. And so we felt that it was a good time for us to stop and take a moment to look again at earthquake and through a slightly different lens, um, in addition to the normal part of, you know, do you have your go bag? Do you have your food? Do you, do you have your contact numbers? But to talk about some of the things, the aspects of earthquake that uh, you'll see sometimes brought up on next door and people trade their perceptions about it and their opinions about it, but nobody necessarily has an answer. Um, so this evening, we are delighted to have experts here with us to talk about very, uh, various aspects of dealing with a large scale earthquake, including understanding earthquake insurance, uh, the structural stability of our homes and our businesses, how our emergency services system is prepared to respond to a major disaster in which we're likely to be sheltering in place rather than evacuating. Um, and finally, the emotional aspects of both preparing for and responding to a major disaster. So this evening, each of our speakers is going to have about 15 minutes to present to us. And during the time that a speaker is speaking, we ask that you put your questions in the chat so you don't have to worry about forgetting them. Just write them in the chat and they will be there and we'll be monitoring the chat. Um, once all four of our speakers have finished, we'll open it up for Q&A and we'll be both pulling from the chat and calling on people who have their virtual hands raised. Um, I said we're going to be recording it. Also, if you have any questions for us about follow-up to this event or the future, or you want to, you want to sign up to be a block captain, <laughs> um, Ted, if you could also put in the chat our email address is tanvalleynrg at gmail.com and send us a message and we will get back to you. Okay, so our first speaker this evening is Janiel Maffei. And Janiel uh, has lost power and she is, Janiel, are you in your car? I am in my car around the corner because we have horrible reception at our house. <laughs> okay, so um, and so she was going to be running her presentation herself, and Ted is going to be running her. Um, we had a backup for her, so he'll be running that for her. But I, <laughs> this is talk about resiliency and being prepared. Um, Janelle has been the chief mitigation officer with the California Earthquake Authority since 2011. Her responsibilities include the California Residential Mitigation Program and the development of comprehensive guidelines for the retrofit of single family dwellings. She earned her bachelor's in architecture and her master's in civil engineering from UC Berkeley. And she's worked in the earthquake engineering field for almost 40 years as a registered structural engineer with experience that includes the design of new building structures 
and seismic strengthening of existing structures. In addition to leadership positions on multiple industry boards, Janiel serves currently as president of the Structural Engineers Association of Northern California. She has extensive poster earthquake reconnaissance experience from the Loma Prieta and from the Northridge earthquakes. So thank you very much, Janiel. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. And so I'll just say next slide and move right into our presentation. Um, so basically the, the, the theme here is things to know about earthquake risk. So we'll talk about risk, we'll talk about what the CEA is and uh, most importantly about retrofit, about mitigating or reducing the likelihood of damage. Next slide. So California is earthquake country. It's home to two thirds of the nation's earthquake risk. Alaska has more earthquakes than we do, but we have more people and we have strategically placed them along the San Andreas Fault there, along that red zone there, which is not just one fault, but of course a series of faults other, either side. Um, we, we lie on the, the plate uh, boundary between the North American and Pacific plate. Next slide, please. Uh, there's more than a 99% chance of a one or more magnitude 6.7 or greater earthquakes striking California in the next 30 years. And that number is, that magnitude is what the Northridge earthquake was. Um, it's just a near certainty in California. A little bit smaller when you look at individual cities or counties and individual houses. But I think it's just best that we, we consider ourselves to be an earthquake country. Next slide, please. Uh, so that everybody is, is aware of the San Andreas Fault, of course, runs right through that, that um, uh, temp why have I forgotten the name of it? Tamales Bay. I live in Oakland, so this is home. So I, I'm just a little bit thrown, I think, today. Um, and of course, the, the, the most recent earthquake, the 2014 Napa earthquake, we all felt. But of course, earthquakes are, are predominantly local in terms of they have to be really, really big to, to hit a large area. So we felt it, but it wasn't the test. Next slide. Uh, so here is the 1906 earthquake. This, of course, if it were to happen again, would be um, catastrophic. Uh, obviously, 1906, there wasn't as much population. Um, but look at, look at the length of it. We say the San Francisco earthquake. It was really the Northern California earthquake. 250 miles of fault rupture. Next slide, please. Uh, and of course, there was the Loma Prieta earthquake, which was uh, 100 miles from Marin County. Um, so, you know, we, we certainly saw damage. We saw damage. Uh, away from the epicenter and the fault rupture to very poor buildings and particularly poor buildings on soft soil. Uh, you put that earthquake a little closer to everyone's home and of course there's a significantly higher probability for damage. Next slide please. But look at the difference. Look at uh, this is a, there, these are to scale here. Um, when I said earthquakes are usually local, um, there's the North, uh, pardon me, the North American or, or San Francisco uh, plate pardon me, the San Francisco earthquake on the left and the Loma Prieta on the right, the difference in the area that was affected. Next slide, please. So let's go over some myths. These are the kind of myths that we're constantly trying to overcome. The first is everyone thinks that their policy is gonna cover them for earthquakes and it absolutely does not. There is, a, there is a law that specifically separated the earthquake insurance policy from the homeowner's policy. So a separate policy is required. And of course it's the same for floods. Next slide. And then of course, the, the notion that the government will bail me out. Well, FEMA isn't there as an insurance company. They're not there to make us whole again after an earthquake. Uh, it, they will provide grants that are limited to urgent health and safety needs. And then of course, if you have means, the reality is you, you, you don't qualify for FEMA funds, but rather for an SBA loan. Now they're low interest, but of course that would be on top of your mortgage and it is a loan, it has to be paid back. Next slide, please. So who is the CEA? The CEA is a not-for-profit residential earthquake insurer, next slide, a unique instrumentality of the state. And in order to understand why we were created, you have to go back to 1984 when the MAC was, was invented, uh, when the, the California legislature created the mandatory offer law. This is when they specifically separated earthquake insurance from the homeowner's policy, but to make it available to homeowners, they mandated that if you write a homeowner's policy in California, you must offer earthquake insurance. So to, to, play, to play in the insurance world in California, you must offer earthquake insurance. And, um, and so it, it was very, very popular. Of course, we're an amazing market for an insurance company. Next slide. 
But along came 1994, the Northridge earthquake, $40 billion worth of damage, half of that residential, half of that insured. And modeling was at its infancy. There, you know, there, that map was, was not a supercomputer by any stretch. Um, and so they really didn't understand the, the depth uh, and the amount of, of losses that they were going to have to cover. And with that mandatory offer law, they were going to stop writing policies in the state and leave the state. It was a tremendous crisis. And so this legislature stepped in to create the California Earthquake Authority. Next slide. The CEA is publicly managed. Our board includes designees for the three top elected officials and two non-voting members that represent the Senate and the, and the Assembly, uh, but privately financed. We have participating insurers who, when they join us, bring a certain amount of money. And then, of course, our policyholders are uh, providing premiums each year. Our mission is to educate, mitigate, and insure. Educate because people should make informed decisions. Mitigate, let's reduce damage where we can. And then of course insurers are core business. Next slide, please. Uh, it's very easy to understand what your premium will be with the CEA because on earthquakeauthority.com, we have a premium calculator. So you can go in and you put your address in, very important location, and then information about your house and it will give you exactly what your premium would be with a CEA policy. You can, you can do a deductible from five to, to, to 25%. You can change all kinds of different things. And of course it has lots of information so that you'll understand what the deductible is, understand what, what the contents are. So very easy to figure out what your, your uh, premium will be. Uh, but we're not always the, the least expensive option. And being a not-for-profit instrumentality of the state, we'd like you to make sure that you shop around. There are other companies, GeoVera, Palomar, um, or you may have an insurance company that's one of the rare ones that actually offers earthquake insurance. And so do shop around, get a, 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 an agent or a broker to look into uh, what's the best policy for you. Next slide, please. Uh, and here are our participating insurers. So I have a state policy, pardon me, a state farm policy, and that is who I purchased my CEA earthquake insurance through. In the event of an earthquake, state farm would be the, the folks that would come out and adjust the claim. If I have a, a payment, it would come from the CEA. So these are our participating insurers. We didn't create a, a whole brand new insurance company, but rather rely on these insurance companies that are already in place to provide those services. Next slide. Um, so this is our financial situation. Is that with the tower on the left is the CEA's financial strength. Six billion in cash, uh, conservatively invested, of course, reinsurance which is insurance for insurance companies, and then some um, other kinds of financing at the top. Uh, this is uh, just under $20 billion worth of financial capability. Uh, we can handle an earthquake with a, a probability of one in 400 happening in any year. We could handle two Northridge earthquakes. We could handle the 1906 earthquake again. And you look at me, you go, well, wait, $40 billion. Well, it's because um, fewer than, uh, I think, 12% of Californians have insurance. And um, in areas like uh, Napa, there were fewer than 6% with insurance. Uh, but let me tell you how we finance the mitigation that we're doing. From that 6.2 billion, the state legislature, when they created the CEA, stated that you will put 5% of your investment income up to $5 million into mitigation. And when I joined in 2011, there were $25 million in the pot and we created the California Residential Mitigation Program. Next slide, please. Um, so with this program, the intent was to reduce the expected loss. So we're, we're attacking the risk. Now, risk is hazard plus vulnerability plus exposure. We've already established that California just plain has a hazard and we've put most of our people right in the middle of it. Uh, so we live in earthquake country. Vulnerability is very much about the building. It's very much about the house. And um, you can relate that to the age of the house because of course that correlates to the, the year of construction and the building uh, code that it was designed to. Exposure, exposure for an individual is the single most expensive investment they'll likely make in their life. It is their home, it's where their family sleeps. Um, it has a, an emotional attachment to it. And so very, very important work that we're doing. Next slide. So seismic vulnerability is um, about, once again, it's about how the home will perform in an earthquake. Next slide. 
And we understand the top four vulnerabilities in California. And I'm going to start on the right. Unreinforced masonry chimneys. I will tell you that now we really don't recommend that you brace it to your house. It really should come down. And you don't want the earthquake to be the, the, uh, the construction crew that's taking it down. Um, the idea here is they're very heavy. And not only can they, can they fall and, and do a lot of damage to your home or your neighbor's home, but rather they can actually drive the response of the house. Sometimes they're so heavy. Um, so uh, we have a lot of information on our website about that. Um, Hillside Homes, this was a, a poll supported home. We fortunately don't have a lot of those very expensive to repair, uh, deadly, and of course expensive to retrofit. But we're attacking the two on the left because these are, are very common in California and really very cost effective to uh, mitigate. So let's go to the next slide and I'll talk about the first vulnerability, which is the cripple wall house. Here's a house that came off its foundation in the 2014 earthquake. And you can see that greenhouse, the floor was at the top of those stairs. So this came down quite a ways. Uh, nobody was killed in any of these houses in Napa, but of course you can imagine when you and the furniture are flying around and coming down four to five feet, um, it's very dangerous. It's very expensive too, next slide and very disruptive. Um, so there's a cripple wall. We call these cripple wall houses because they have these short, less than full height stud walls that go around the crawl space. Next slide, please. When they come off of their foundation, it can be dangerous. Uh, this house was very fortunate that it, it, it severed the gas line, but there was no fire because you can see the porch was blocking the front door. Of course, if this was a, um, the residents had uh, mobility issues, of course, egress was blocked. Very, very dangerous. Next slide. And of course, disruptive. This beautiful Victorian came down off its foundation. This I took this picture the morning of the earthquake. It came down later. Um, and so the uh, owner posted online that it was about $300,000 just to shore the house and put it back on its foundation. Next slide, please. So what's the solution? Retrofit. So retrofit, very importantly, is not earthquake proofing a house. Very, very important. Um, but rather to, to put in elements that address a, a known vulnerability to make it more likely to remain habitable. Next slide, please. And we have a program called Earthquake Brace and Bolt. We've, we've provided up to $3,000 grants for over 16,000 homes in California in highest, areas of highest seismicity. Now, the good news is we're, we're giving out money to help people retrofit. The bad news is we're not in Marin County yet, but people in Marin County can put their email on our website into our, our database and we'll let them know when we're, when we're going to be in Marin County. So they can come to our website, get lots of information about what they might be looking to do and um, look to see a $3,000 grant for what is on average between a five and $6,000 retrofit statewide. Next slide, please, sorry. Uh, so here's the retrofit. We're going in and we're anchoring the wood part of the house to the concrete part of the house with bolts. Next slide. If you have a tall uh, wall in there, there's those cripple walls. You're going to put bolts in. You're going to put plywood, nail it like a shear wall, clip it to the top. There's bent holes there. Next slide. If you have a, a shorter cripple wall, of course, you can't get in there with a, a hammer, pardon me, a roto hammer to put in an anchor bolt. So we come in from the side with anchor bolts. There's plywood with those bent holes, clips at the top of that short stud wall. Next slide. And sometimes your floor sits directly on the concrete. So we still come in to, from the side with those foundation plates to anchor the wood to the concrete and we put in clips. Once again, between five and $6,000 on average in California, more expensive in the Bay Area. This particular stem wall retrofit though can be as little as four to $5,000. Next slide, please. We have a contractor's directory on our list. You can put your zip code in, find contractors who do this work, who are close to you. There are also professional design professionals, engineers who can help you if you have a complicated house or if you have a very tall cripple wall. Next slide, please. We've seen that it works. Here are two houses in the Napa earthquake, almost identical with the exception of that porch. House on the left came off its foundation two and a half years later, not yet reoccupied. Family on the right had damage. It's not earthquake proofing your house, but it was damage that did not create a red tag situation. They were able to, to shelter in place and to stay in that house. Next slide, please. We're also going to be introducing a new program called Earthquake Soft Story, ESS, later this year to tackle the, the um, unfortunate um, introduction of, a, of an attached garage meant they took out all of the elements that resist earthquake forces, which are walls. Next slide. And here's a San Francisco 1989 um, house that came down. Very, very big problem for San Francisco. Next slide, please. 
But once again, a cost-effective retrofit. You go in and you put in plywood or OSB. This is a new house, but it's the same elements. You put in elements either side of that garage door that are going to resist earthquake forces. And once again, significantly reduce the, the likelihood that you have to move out, increase the likelihood of habitability, and protect that home, that, that single largest expense that most people will make. Next slide, please. Um, CEA mitigation also has strengthenmyhouse.com. Next slide, which is simply all the information I've been talking about, but it doesn't include the earthquake brace and bolt or earthquake soft story program. It's, it's sometimes distressing for folks to go and find out that, oh, this is what I should do, but there's no grant. So this is a place to go to get all the information um, without that, that grant information coming at you as well. So you can recommend this to folks in Marin County, strengthenmyhouse.com, and recommend that they put their email in on our earthquakebracebolt.com site. Next slide, please. It's been my pleasure. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you in person or even have my, my face, um, but earthquakebracebolt.com, strengthenmyhouse.com, lots of information, and it was a privilege to speak with you tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janelle. That, that was great. Um, I learned a lot already <laughs> and I'm sure everyone else did as well. So thank you, we really appreciate it. Um, next, uh, our, I am very pleased to be able to introduce Bijan Razi. Bijan has been with the city of Mill Valley for the past four years, formerly as the um, senior building inspector, and now he is currently the building official. He's a graduate of Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. He earned his bachelor's in business administration with a concentration in finance, and then his master's in industrial and technical studies. As a California general contractor class B since 1996, Bijan has specialized in multifamily mid-rise building construction. He is, a, he is certified by the International Code Council and is also a certified evaluator for the state's Office of Emergency Services Safety Assessment Program. And fun fact, um, he's living in Napa on a vineyard. He has a winery on the Silverado Trail. So <laughs> thank you, Bijan. Thank you very much. All right, I'm gonna try and share my screen right now for everybody here. All right, let's see. All right, can everybody see this? Yes. All right. Okay, I uh, just wanted to kind of just dial it back a little bit and just start out um, by starting with what we can do before and uh, during and then after an earthquake. Um, so basically uh, people think, well, when they, when they think of structure, they think of the structural integrity, uh, what that's gonna happen with the structure, et cetera, during the earthquake, it's performance. Um, and thank you, Janelle, for bringing all the items up about retrofitting, et cetera. Um, but one of the other things that people also uh, forget about, which is something that they can really easily do, is taking care of things um, like removing, relocating, or securing objects in their house. A lot of injuries do occur during the actual earthquake, um, falling, they get hurt, um, blocking exits, starting a fire, and then mostly cleanup. Um, and we can avoid a lot of that. So I'm going to start in that area and start working my way down. So I have a little bit, uh, let me see, zoom back. An earthquake hazard home or hazard hunt. So let's talk about these items. So there are a lot of things in your house that can be done. Um, and simply, we talked uh, simply, Janelle brought up about racing the chimney and Sometimes, as we all know, these are unreinforced. If they could come down, that's great. Sometimes there are sizable costs that comes along with it to actually bring it down. Um, we could strap down computers. We could secure our ceiling fans and hanging light fixtures, make sure there's enough backing to support them. Sometimes people put heavy uh, new ceiling fans or lights in, and they don't even realize what types of brackets or backing that are behind them. We could strap down our televisions, our expensive items that we don't even think about that are always just freestanding. 
And then we have items such as securing our cabinets, um, you know, making sure that our appliances have flexible connectors. All gas appliances should have flexible connectors for exactly this. Or it's going to be moving around. We want to make sure that everything can move and perform. And then another thing that people forget about, especially their stoves, is they have a, a tipping device, and you can make sure that you install that behind there. A lot of times when people buy a new range, you just slide it right into place and they forget about the anti-tipping device and they simply just uh, go about their way until there's something that happens. So um, the other thing that happens at my house in particular is my wife loves photos and pictures. She hangs everything, including over the bed. You should securely fasten those or relocate them into a different place because those types of objects are going to be the ones that are going to come down. And then you have bookshelves with all kinds of items, everything in there. And these are also going to be moving around. So I'll get into a little bit more detail in a second here. But there, we talked about the crawl space already. Janelle brought that up about bracing. I'll jump into that just briefly. And then um, the other parts that we should all know is where to shut off our utilities. Where to, If we don't know where our water shutoffs are, our gas shutoffs, we should find that out and we should have the proper tools to actually do that. So let me just keep moving down. So what would happen? Let's talk about bookcases. How much would fall off those shelves? Um, you can use simple things like uh, childproof locks to keep any of these drawers from opening, any of the uh, openings for the doors, anything that's secured to there, you should also have flexible straps and fasteners to keep those from coming down. We have things like in your bathrooms, uh, glass bottles. A lot of people have those types of objects in their bathrooms, near their bathtubs, et cetera. Those can also cause a huge hazard. Um, their chimney, we talked about that briefly too as well. There are some types of securing, but ultimately, and we'll get into that, um, a lot of these bracing and stuff will slow things down, but unreinforced truly means unreinforced. Garage portals, I see a lot of these in Mill Valley where the old framing is all exposed. The portals are pretty small on here and it can be as simple as plying them in order to keep the actual movement of the building in the small openings because they could be supporting second stories, et cetera. Um, Janiel spoke about underneath your house. You can simply look underneath there to see if you actually have bolting down right now. Some, most of these older homes don't have actual anchor bolts holding down the actual sill plate. Um, you can also see if you have ply one on either the inside or the outside of the building just simply by peering through. If you have exposed studs on those walls or exposed cripple walls, you can actually see if any of that plywood is on the outside of the building. And if it's not on the outside or inside, you might think about actually doing, going through a program and actually having that done. The other thing that I see a lot because I am a building inspector is water heaters that are improperly strapped. Thank goodness some of these old water heaters that have lasted 40, 50 years are now finally coming to an end. Um, you people are going for higher efficiency, et cetera. But what it's done is it's allowed us to check to make sure that there's actually two straps braced on the top and bottom third of the water heater. I see a lot of old water heaters that simply have a fine plumbing strap that's hooked right across the middle of it. And that is something that could easily be taken care of. So there are programs, as Janiel mentioned on there, a lot of the new homes already have hold downs bracing that comes in there. That's new construction. You'll find it's very common to find any type of shear walls that are actually braced on both ends by hold downs, et cetera. And there are options, as Janiel mentioned, about simplifying the seismic assessment. So you can go in and their FEMA has already made a guideline that kind of helps as a checklist. Um, hiring a professional always helps, but making sure that you see these anchor bolts in place. If you don't see them around there, any sill bolts, mud sill, any of that bolted down, you should probably ask the question, what could happen to my house if there is an earthquake? Could it lift up off the foundation? Could it simply move over? And there's different ways that actually doing it. And there is an assessment that can be done. This is a lengthy uh, guide, but you can actually go to it and at least get some simple pointers. 
So jumping back into what happens during an earthquake. Now, everybody is obviously has their own idea where to be in an earthquake. And most people are gonna think, well, I should just run out the door, get away from the building. And that would be great if you were at the front door, but most people aren't. So the best thing to do is drop to the ground and take cover and get under anything, a sturdy piece of table, hold on, whatever you need to do, but don't run out of the building as most of that stuff, you can crouch in the inside corner of the building, but just don't run out of the building because during that, most objects are gonna start falling down. Any of those could be from the inside, the outside. So in the kids' classroom, they just drop cover and hold on. But the main thing to do is drop to the ground before you get knocked down, because in a big earthquake, you're gonna be thrown around a little bit. And some of us have already been in those. Cover your head and neck with one hand. At the minimum, get underneath something sturdy and just hold on. That would be my best suggestion to you. So now the main thing that I wanted to talk to you about was after an earthquake. So there's a lot of things that you're gonna to have to expect that's gonna happen after the earthquake. There's gonna be aftershocks. Those aftershocks can be stronger than you would ever think. They can lead to additional damage. And you gotta already remember that your structure might be weakened already. And that this can happen first hour, days, weeks, months but you have to get eventually an assessment if your home has been damaged by an engineer or local building official. And that's where I wanna come in and talk to you about what you guys can expect during that and the response of what you will see from places like the building division um, in each of the cities. So along the way, Cal OES decided that they needed some help. And so they started getting local building inspectors because there's hundreds, maybe thousands of structures that could be damaged during an earthquake. And most building departments like ours, Mill Valley, well, we only have two building inspectors. So that's not gonna help if all these people are gonna wanna stay in their homes and they're gonna be wanting to make sure that somebody does a, a quick assessment. So what it did was Cal OES decided they're gonna have trained professionals available to assist the local governments. So through the Cal OES safety assessment program, they provide experienced professionals who can quickly evaluate the damaged structures. And fortunately, we have a lot of architects, civil engineers, structural engineers, geotechnical engineers, and we also have ICC certifications for building inspectors through different states who can actually do this. And so they set up a training program to allow people to actually understand and know what they're going to be looking for, because the whole idea is to get as many people and keep as many people in their homes as possible. You can't just go around and decide, well, every single building is because it has some form of damage on it is no longer livable. And if we did, we'd have thousands of people displaced all at once, which could never be absorbed. So we ended up with a safety assessment program. And in that program, what we did was they had the assistance of Cal OES then could ask for EMAC, Emergency Management Assistance Compact, which would allow other places to send and other states could use a reciprocal agreement to happen. So in other words, and this can also be for other things other than just earthquakes. So for example, the state of California sent resources uh, to uh, Katrina, Hurricane Katrina in 2005. And they set up a hierarchy in order to, so that local governments would have some ability to do this. Now, what? how can you tell somebody who comes to your house doesn't actually have, let's say, you know, a badge from the city of Mill Valley and you're living in Mill Valley? Well, they decided they needed identification cards. And this is the type of identification that you will see. You will see a Cal OES state of california safety assessment program and it'll tell what they are they're volunteers an architect they're a building inspector like myself they're a civil engineer they can be working for caltrans and they will simply be identified and they will do an assessment well you ask well what's that assessment going to look like well the assessment's going to be pretty straightforward they're going to start looking at things that other people might notice and say oh well what is this for example shear cracking it's pretty straightforward. Most of the portals and the openings will show signs of that quickly. Or you might see things like soft story failure, which in San Francisco is very common. In Mill Valley, we don't have a lot of these structures, 
but we do have structures that have living space above and have small openings. Typically, you'll see um, apartment buildings that might only have you know existing small portals or poles holding them up, and they're subject to this type of soft story failure. But most of us are going to have houses around here. And this is an example of a house that wasn't properly bolted down or didn't have enough hold downs or tie downs on it. And as you can see, it leaped up off the foundation during the earthquake and it shifted across there. Then you have in different areas, you might have two buildings that react similar or dissimilar in an earthquake and they clap together. And that's a, called the pounding effect, in which case they both don't react at the same rate and they beat each other up during the actual earthquake. You can have a roof wall connection failure, which is the similar materials once again, that will ultimately separate because they react differently. Some being more flexible, some being more rigid and they react differently during an earthquake and that earth movement. Then you might just have simple failure like the uh, concrete wall in this case is completely failed and it, the rebar has held it in place. And the good thing about rebar is that it's flexible but the rigid structure around it, the concrete did not hold together. Or you might have collapse. Like for example, if you have um, shopping centers or any types of larger department stores, you might have these walls that are tilt-up walls. And then you have the worst of them all when the ground actually starts moving, this, the scarp, or in this case, this building was separated by the actual earthquake in two different sections because of the elevation of the ground. One area was softer than the other. You could have liquefaction of the soil, et cetera. Partial collapse of structures would also be common. Now, the good thing is we live in an area where mostly we have single family residential. So you're gonna be dealing with less and less of those. But here's a prime example of what Janiel was talking about and what could happen with your unreinforced chimney. You most certainly wouldn't want to be sleeping down here by the fireplace when this comes down. And so even after an earthquake, the important thing is not to actually try and reside, even if your chimney is still intact, leave this room alone. If it didn't fall out of the building already, leave this room alone your chances are that you would not be using this area even if it looked intact. Just stay away from any area with unreinforced masonry or anything heavy enough that it could come through your roof. So now in order to get an understanding of what's happening when somebody comes out to your house and actually does this after an earthquake, there's gonna be a three placard system and it's gonna be as clear as can be just like street lights, green, yellow, and red. And we obviously know red is the worst and green means it's been inspected and it's okay for entry. But don't think that that means that it's completely okay. And that's the part we have to go through. So when you get a green placard on here, it means it's lawful to occupy. And it will mean that there's no apparent hazards found. The re there might be repairs that are still required. The later lateral and vertical load capacities may not have significantly decreased and it's okay to occupy. There'll be inspection comments in there. And the best part to actually do is to check those comments, especially if you've been away and you walk up and you find one of these tags on your building, because you might not be there at the time these are tagged, most likely you will not. And what you're gonna find is that on the tag, it's gonna tell you it's the condition of the building. This does not mean that the building survived unscathed it's gonna have some minor damage to it. It could be the stucco, it could be the siding, it could be some other elements, but either way, it does not mean that it's okay completely. You will actually have to have it looked at at some point, but it's not a high priority. So let's get into the restricted use one. This is the yellow one. And this is the area where most buildings that we want them to be. And when I say that, the whole goal is to keep as many people in their homes as possible. As we talked about earlier, we don't want to have people, just everybody out and all the buildings are tagged and there's no way that you can live in them, et cetera. That would be a horrible scenario. And obviously there's not enough places to go. So the criteria of this is then that the building's been damaged, but it may or may not be habitable. There are falling hazards part of the building. There might be damage of lateral force, vertical load, um, but it's still able to resist some of the loads. And that's where the judgment of the SAP evaluator will come into play. So occupancies can be permitted. 
but it doesn't mean it's completely permitted, but it could be permitted. So you'll also once again look because the idea behind the placard is that the building suffered some damage, but portions of it may be used. And that's also a key. We have to talk about portions of it being actually used. So the placard will be filled out and with a brief explanation of the damage to describe the appropriate restrictions. You might find yellow caution tape around areas, um, but the most important thing is it will identify the restrictions. You might only be able to use certain rooms, um, maybe certain doorways, but you are only allowed to, or maybe even only retrieve possessions at a limited time. So here's some examples of what you might think hey, when you read. Bijan, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. We're a little bit past time. If you can hit the last key points. So oh, sure. Next so the, here's a few things that you might want to just keep in mind. So this would be what they would think is a yellow tag or red tag building, but it's not. It still could be retrievable. This is one that was a yellow tag home in Northridge, where once again, looks like it's red tag, but it's not. It's still usable. This area, the front door is not good. This carport's not good, but you might have entry and utilities might be used. So then the last one will be red tag and you don't want to go into this one at all um, unless you're actually have uh, authority to do so. And this, but keep in mind, this is not, this is for extreme hazard buildings, imminent danger, significant decreases, decreases in the lateral force and it's unsafe. So this is not a demolition order. And the only reason I'd say that is, for example, in Loma Prieta, the earthquake, there were 350 red tags that were given out in San Francisco, but only 50 of the buildings had to be demolished, meaning they were all got to be repaired. So I'll skip through all the drawings or the heavy damaged homes, uplift. Um, obviously, you don't want to be that guy. Uh, but then there is three uh, keys for the rapid evaluation, detailed evaluation, engineered evaluation, which is the most important one at the very end. And if you guys need any resources whatsoever, this is where you could obtain them from the FEMA website. That was great. Bijan, thank you so much. We, we really appreciate that. That's fabulous information. And um, it's actually a, a great setup for Woody. Now that we've seen all those pictures of what can happen, um, <laughs> this is perfect for you, Woody. Woody Baker Cohn is the Assistant Emergency Services Manager for the Marin County Office of Emergency Services. After almost 30 years in the for-profit technology sector, Woody transitioned to emergency and disaster management and spent many years working with the American Red Cross before coming to the Marin County Sheriff's Office where he manages the Emergency Operations Center and provides direction and oversight to the entire emergency operations system, including all large-scale emergencies. In this position, Woody's work includes coordinating and collaborating with all 12 Bay Area counties, as well as the state, to develop strategies and plans to mitigate, prepare for, respond to, and recover from disasters, including regional mutual response aid, sheltering, alert and warning, and technology. So Woody, thank you so much. Take it away. All right, thank you. That was such a wonderful uh, intro. When you sent it to me last night, I sent it off to my wife and kids. <laughs> <laughs> so I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate everybody um, uh, you know, listening to my words this evening. Uh, so really going through what we do uh, as a county, uh, let me first just give some context because we've got kind of the alphabet soup of things uh, that is, is very, very confusing if you're not involved in it. So I work in the Office of Emergency Services. So that's a group under the Sheriff's Office now that, uh, that organizes things. We, we plan for emergencies and manage the emergencies. There's something called the Emergency Operations Center, which is a facility where my office is. And that involves, uh, we, we run it, but we run it uh, with a huge number of, of county and other agency workers. So that's how we respond uh, to an emergency, how we support the field response, things like that. Uh, cities and towns uh, mostly have some sort of emergency operations center themselves. So people in, a, in a, uh, an incorporated city or town will probably be working with their 
EOC, at least up to some level, and then the, their EOC will work with the county. It's just sort of a hierarchical system that allows uh, allows the response to work most efficiently. You know, if two cities are next to each other and you can borrow a dump truck from one, that's a lot quicker than ordering one from the feds, uh, not to mention cheaper. Uh, agencies have what are called department operation centers, but they're the, essentially the same thing, coordinating the response. And all these things are for kind of extraordinary responses. They're not the everyday house fire or, or the, you know, sort of run of the mill, you know, smaller disasters that can be very tragic, but are well within uh, an agency or jurisdiction's normal ability to, uh, to supply resources. Uh, then we, of course, work with partner agencies. So that can be anything from the National Park Service uh, to, um, you know, other, you know, the Coast Guard within the county, things like that. Uh, and then, Ultimately, we wind up working with the with the state and with the federal government. And what I've tried to show in this in this graphic is kind of how how all this folds together underneath the county. It's an organized hierarchical way to both keep track of, of what's going on, what the needs are, but also to get um, to get additional resources. So we have a big earthquake. We're going to be needing additional resources uh, from adjacent counties to the degree they have any. They'll, of course, in an earthquake be strapped as well, uh, and from the state and ultimately from, from the federal government. And that's, that's how we go ahead and request those things. Um, so with that, just a little more about the Office of Emergency Services. Uh, what, what I call here a blue sky day, I, I realized as I was writing that, that's sort of jargon in and of itself, but just sort of a run-of-the-mill day when we're not having an earthquake, we're not having COVID, we're not having you know, extraordinary rains, things of that nature. What we do is we mon monitor and manage the routine events. So that can be anything from, uh, you know, something fairly benign like uh, flooding or, or even, you know, smoke from a distant fire that drives a lot of 911 calls. But it can be things like, uh, uh, you know, we've had a shipwreck out in uh, Bodega Bay for, I think, about a year now. So dealing with the aftermath of that, uh, there pretty much every day there's some sort of hazardous materials release in the county. Thankfully, they're usually just small sewage spills, occasionally at a gas station, gas spills, so very manageable things. So we kind of keep track of those, and if they get big, uh, we, we can assist with support there uh, at various levels. Uh, we um, uh, operate and maintain the county's alert warning systems. Uh, so alert Marin is what probably most people are aware of, and if you're not already uh, registered for that, I, I strongly real, uh, urge you to do that. Uh, but there's other systems we assist with. Uh, in Southern Marin, you, you folks have the LRAT system, uh, which, uh, which Southern Marin Fire does a great job with, and we, we're there to back them up with that, uh, and other systems that are more localized. Uh, we maintain uh, situational awareness, which is yet another jargon word, but it's kind of what's going on. So in a routine day, that might just be knowing where uh, controlled burns are. So you smell smoke, you see smoke, you know, we'll know whether there's a controlled burn going on and that's where the smoke's coming from or whether there's really a problem. So that's, you know, again, a fairly benign thing. After an earthquake, it'll be things like what areas still have power, what areas have fires, if that turns out to be a problem. And then other things as we start to, you know, people get back on their feet again, it'll be what areas still have gas stations that have power and are open so that you can get fuel for your vehicle uh, or what pharmacies are open uh, so you can get prescriptions filled, things like that. Uh, we did quite a bit of that in the earlier days of the pandemic during lockdown. In fact, uh, another example would be a large PSPS event, you know, things like that. So keeping track of the situational awareness so we can plan for the response, assist agencies, but, but also to show the public what's going on, right? So you can look up those things. And we have a a new portal I'll get to in a moment that, uh, that allows you to do that very easily. And it's really just going through this cycle um, uh, that I've shown on the right here of, uh, you know, of the preparedness, the, the mitigation and so forth. Uh, we do a lot of work uh, to make sure that the Emergency Operations Center, which is a physical facility, uh, which is earthquake retrofitted and has lots of backup power, backup water, things like that. Uh, and thanks to COVID has backup snacks like you wouldn't believe. I've, I've eaten my weight in Milano cookies many times over. Um, you know, so we keep all that going to be ready as well as sort of the day-to-day -day stuff. Um, and then, uh, you know, looking ahead to the Emergency Operations Center itself, 
Uh, this was actually during an exercise in uh, 2018. I was looking around for a good picture of the EOC full of people recently. And I thought, well, it was, it was COVID. Everybody was trying to work remotely that could. So they weren't very good pictures. <laughs> so I went for, went for this one. <sighs> but we provide uh, a bunch of things here at the county level. We've got a policy group, which drives the direction uh, for a lot of things. So that was very active, of course, uh, and continues to be active for COVID. And that's, uh, that's really chaired by the uh, County Chief Administrative Officer, Matthew Heimel, or one of his assistants, uh, and includes, you know, kind of the major stakeholders. So during COVID, obviously, public health officer uh, was key, uh, you know, for having flooding or earthquake. DPW would be a major stakeholder there, virtually always fire and law are there. And then myself for Chris Riley, who uh, between the two of us, we run the EOC, we'd be there and facilitating. But it's a small group that can make decisions if we've got constrained supplies, where are we gonna send them? What should be the higher priority? Uh, it could be in an extreme case, are we gonna try to facilitate limited evacuations of the county? Uh, even if we had some massive uh, massive disruption, you know, that was, uh, you know, stopped the water supply and we had no power. Maybe that would be an option. That would be a huge policy question. Some of them are smaller, like uh, what are we going to, uh, you know, where, if there's choices on, oh, I don't, one example would be sheltering, which has come up a couple of times. You know, sheltering is very difficult under any circumstances. Marin lacks a lot of large buildings where you can efficiently do sheltering, especially if you take schools out of out of the equation. One of the first things you wanna do after an earthquake or other disruption or get kids back to school to restore some normalcy, also so the parents can start working on cleaning up and rebuilding. So if you open up shelters in a school, you obviously can't have school there. You won't wanna mix those populations. So that's an example of a policy decision. Uh, so the policy group runs it, uh, you know, provides the policy direction. We kind of run the mechanics of it. And an EOC runs in a very, uh, prescribed uh, planning cycle and fashion. So it's very focused, very efficient. And this is all something that comes out of, uh, really out of California firefighting, which pioneered a system called ICS, which is just a, a really rigorous way to run things, which is uh, what is responsible for a lot of the success we've had in, in, the, in the COVID response. Uh, so that can be logistic support, things like that. A lot of, a lot of, um, you know, food, water, sheltering supplies, things like that would go through after a uh, earthquake. We would primarily work with cities and towns um, for people that are in corporated areas uh, and then in unincorporated areas or areas where the cities or towns uh, didn't have the capacity or were overwhelmed, we would manage more of that directly. Uh, I, I left on the bottom here, finance. So finance is the boring thing. I'm, I'm, a, I'm qualified at a high level to run all sections of an emergency operations center, except for finance. Uh, but finance is what will make or break the county. Uh, th th this failure to do this properly can easily bankrupt a jurisdiction because you're putting out all kinds of money. If you're not following proper rules, procurement, things like that, which vary through the cycle of a disaster, you won't get reimbursement from the feds or the state. And you know, these are huge expenditures. So uh, famously, the Northridge earthquake, which was, I think somebody mentioned the day was either 93 or 94. The final FEMA audit for that didn't close out till October of 2016. So it's truly a long running thing that you have to get right. So we have a lot of systems in place to track expenditures. So basically the EOC supports the emergency response, supports fire, law enforcement, you know, DPW, other, other folks out in the field. Um, so an earthquake happens, one of the first things we'll do uh, is we'll, we'll try to figure out what's going on, what resources are needed for emergent you know, uh, things. So, you know, building collapses, fires, things like that. That'll be the first thing we're on. Then we'll start to try to get a picture of how bad is bad so that we can start ordering resources. So we may, you know, we, we've got various models. So we may know that, you know, n number of people are displaced and of those, Maybe some can find alternate housing, but if it's an earthquake, it's a regional event. And if it's a big earthquake, a lot of the, even people with resources may not be able to travel uh, the place that they would go. Maybe that's in just as bad a shape. So sheltering, we'll have to you know, be ordering up sheltering supplies, staff to do that. 
Uh, we would, of course, continue sending alerts and updates uh, as we went. We would uh, convene a, uh, as we do for even, you know, you know, sort of moderate weather events, uh, a conference call or Zoom meeting or something of that ilk, just to share information amongst the uh, jurisdictions and agencies in the county, see who needs help, who you know, can provide help, just that kind of, you know, group, group discussion. We do those, you know, once or twice a day on a kind of very tight um, uh, agenda to keep it uh, keep it moving. We'll coordinate with the Bay Area counties around us, the feds, the state. Uh, we've got uh, what are called prescriptive orders. So we know if we have an earthquake of X magnitude, we know uh, that we'll probably need a whole bunch of stuff and we've got those things prescripted. So we can just fire those right off to the state. You know, things we know we're not gonna be able to get locally. Uh, and then, uh, We'll, we'll have a planning cycle, planning sort of the, the, the biggest magic of the EOC. We go on typically either 12 or 24 hour planning cycles so that we can keep adjusting our priorities, the resource needs, the allocations of personnel and equipment and things like that. Um, I mentioned uh, a moment ago, uh, you know, how we try to keep the public informed and we have not done a good job of getting the word out about this, although increasingly people are finding that we point people to it during alerts, but emergency.marincounty.org is a website uh, that will keep updated. We have the ability to do this remotely. The website is actually hosted up in the cloud in uh, multiple servers. So while it's certainly possible, you may not be able to get to the internet. If you can get to the internet, this will be up and we can update it uh, over satellite, from our phones, from various mechanisms and, and uh, you know, a lot of a lot of the data is fed remotely. Uh, during fire season, we've got all kinds of automatic detection on that. If it's flooding, we've got stream gauges, uh, things like that. Uh, this was used uh, a bunch. We had a fire just north of my office uh, last fall, and we referenced people there, and it got uh, over eighty thousand hits in I don't know, something like forty-five minutes. Uh, and then the atmospheric river in October was another good workout, so it's getting a lot of traffic but just really a way you can find out what's going on. The inset map you see here is actually on the home page, and that will have whatever's going on on it. Many of you may have heard about Zone Haven. The Zone Haven map or the grids you see in there, if you were to zoom in, you would see the zone designation, the label, and it would, it would be colored with what the status is, but it would also show things like if we had opened up evacuation centers, shelters, uh, evacuation uh, routes, things like that will be on there. And we'll just keep updating that. Uh, and that's something that works it works on a smartphone. You don't need a, a computer. At some point, we will try to build a, an app for that so that it would you know, maintain that information offline. Um, and then really just in closing, I, I uh, uh, wanna just again mention, if you're not signed up for Alert Marin, please do so. Uh, there's the URL for the website I just mentioned. Uh, you may also wanna consider signing up for Nixle, which is uh, another system, it's not really an alerting system, it's more of a messaging system, which is, is I guess, more jargon, but you'll get nixels for things like major road closures, uh, sometimes for preparedness messages. Alert Marin is something we'll only use if there's some imminent threat and you need to take protective action. So typically that's evacuate, prepare to evacuate, shelter in place. Uh, we do use it on a limited basis uh, for, um, uh, evacuation drills to get people in the habit, uh, but just really urge people to sign up for Alert Marin. We may do a countywide test of that in the spring along with some other stuff uh, because there is a huge amount of confusion still between Nixle and, and Alert Marin. Um, and then other than that, I just really want to thank all of you for what, what you're doing. Uh, when the earthquake comes and, you know, it's, it's obviously it will come, uh, you know, there, there's no way we can do everything and the importance of groups like NRGs reaching out to neighbors who, you know, maybe uh, have mobility issues or, you know, won't get the word for whatever reason, uh, you know, perhaps uh, have, uh, you know, have, have other needs, you know, the importance of that is huge. Uh, you know, particularly in a count, county like Marin, where we have an older population, and in many cases, you know, people more dispersed just in in you know, particularly West Marin and places like that. So really from the bottom of my heart, uh, thanks for all you guys are doing. That's great, Woody, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. 
Okay. Um, I want to just note we are running a few minutes behind and we realize that and we want to make sure that if you have questions, they get answered. So please go ahead and put your questions in the chat. And if you could put your question, your contact information, and to whom you want to address that question, then if we run out of time, we can follow up um, with our wonderful speakers and get back to you on that. All right. Okay. Our final speaker for the evening, we are so pleased to have with us Kathleen Reese. She's going to be speaking about a very important aspect of disaster that is too often overlooked. Kathy is a certified clinical trauma professional and she is a practicing marriage and family therapist. She's earned multiple master's degrees, including in counselor education, and she is currently the Disaster Mental Health Coordinator for the Marin Red Cross and the co-chair of the Marin Therapist Trauma Response Team. In collaboration with Marin County Behavioral Health and the Marin Medical Reserve Corps, she's involved with the launch this month of a new crisis mental health team to assist in both community and school settings. So Kathy, thank you very much. Thank you, I'm, I'm very happy to be here and trying to figure out how to get this to do full screen, but looks like that's gonna work. So um, welcome everybody. I, do, I did uh, see that I was last and prepared a brief um, presentation tonight, so we should be able to finish up pretty quick. But um, I started out with this photograph because um, Pretty much when an earthquake hits, it's uh, the sense is like, oh my God, now what? You know, I'm sure all kinds of different comments would come out and all different kinds of vernaculars with that. But basically it's like, oh, what do we do? And this was uh, in Kenya, I ended up not it, about six feet from this lion. And that was exactly what I felt when this picture was taken. It was, oh, I took this photograph, but um, but anyway, the idea is that, what do we do? So, oh, there it is. Oh, okay, sorry about that. Uh, now, how do I move ahead? Here we go. So disasters are inevitable. That's what we just found out this evening. And uh, we live in an earthquake zone. So preparation, many people go into denial. And so you folks obviously haven't and the very, best thing that you can do is prepare for that disaster because actually preparation will minimize the, um, the traumatic aspects and the out, it will help to, ben, ben, to your benefit uh, the outcome of that disaster. So what does that mean? So to psychologically prepare for a disaster means, first of all, you should know yourself. You should know your re own reactions to stress and your own ways to calm yourself. So First, so know yourself. And then second of all, what Woody mentioned, um, recognize that different family members and community members are gonna have very different experiences in a disaster and different needs are gonna arise because of that. So for example, your children, your seniors, your disabled, they're gonna have um, you know, different experiences than an able-bodied person. And so knowing your neighbor, exactly what you folks are doing is a perfect way of preparing your community to have the best outcome in a disaster. And interestingly, this really stuck with me as I did the preparation, having, uh, making healthy lifestyle choices in your day-to-day -day as preparation for just having a good healthy life actually is preparing you very much for a disaster. If you think about it, um, if you're, short on sleep or you haven't eaten all day and you know something happens you're not going to be in as good a shape to help yourself or to help others around you if a disaster strikes so the more I thought about it the more it's like just really paying attention to your life and your family and having a good healthy lifestyle getting exercise and resting eating well just the basic knowing yourself um, is going to prepare you as well for a disaster as just about anything. So that was a really nice thing to discover. And I wanted to just sort of emphasize that 
in a disaster, if that happens, is really to recognize that humans are social creatures that by definition, any kind of disaster is gonna overwhelm us, uh, affect our social structure and disrupt the usual function of society. That's why we're turning to the EOC and we want people like Woody who are gonna help guide us through this kind of disaster because we don't know what to do, right? So it's recognizing that banding together exactly again what you folks are doing is the best way to help survive that um, disaster of any type is know your neighbor, know where your family members are, connect with the people that are meaningful for you and really um, support each other through it. And the people that have that kind of social support do the best. So keeping that in mind. So um, moving on, oops, okay, so I do know that there's more, here we go. So when an earthquake strikes, I thought it was most important to recognize that our emotional and psychological reactions are gonna be in stages. You can imagine there's an initial shock, fear, a whole array of emotions, and that the most important thing in the psychological state and resentment reacting to a disaster is to bring people to the present, address their immediate needs. So that involves water, water shelter, comfort, first aid, those kinds of things. And, and, just, and that helps people bring them to the present moment. So when the, you're addressing things that are in the present moment, people tend to calm down. So that's um, why, why this is an important thing to keep in mind is there's gonna be an initial shock, but then address those immediate needs and that really helps people. And remembering to give extra attention to our vulnerable population. And moving along, there's gonna be an interim of confusion and you know, in the adjustment stage, that probably doesn't have much that I can describe about that. It's gonna be kind of crazy and chaotic, but eventually communities do move into a recovery and a rebuilding phase. And what I've heard from people is that that phase is very frustrating, takes a long time. All the insurance agents that we've just heard about in the EOC, eh, FEMA, you just heard, takes 12, 14 years to close out a disaster. So I've heard it takes a really long time and that's why I put the giraffe here, long view. <laughs> So there we go. And then going back to the first um, slide of, well, what can we do to protect, um, have the positive coping mechanisms to help minimize the um, impact of a disaster? And that is exactly what we've been talking about, connecting with family and friends, uh, getting back immediately as you can into any kind of a normal routine. That actually is really an important one is um, that routine structure really helps to counter the chaos of a disaster. Going back to knowing yourself and how to calm yourself in your go bag, have things that calm yourself. If you've got kids, put in stuffed toys in a blanket. If you, for you, make sure you've got your favorite music set, you know, and stuff like that and what you need for aromatherapy or whatever, just, and then keeping a positive attitude, you're gonna get through this. Everybody does. Most people do get through disasters and most people don't suffer too many negative effects. So um, long-term, it just takes time. So do what you can for yourself and others, make plans and carry them out so that you feel that success and then stay balanced and connected within your daily life before the disaster so that you have these skills in hand. And was that it? I think that, oh no, oh. So if many of you, I'm hoping have kids, if you do, um, I found this resource that was written by a therapist and a school psychologist. And, it, and they were saying that the best thing you can do for your family is to talk about earthquakes and what to do. And they wrote this book um, to help kids prepare. And um, so I wanted the parents in the group to know about it. I just bought the book. I don't have it to show you, but I'm going to share it with my grandkids. So I wanted people to know about that. And that was it. Okay, and lastly, um, 
uh, okay, so there's a wonderful woman. She's very famous in the state, Lucy Jones. She's a seismologist that has worked on um, preparing California for earthquake. She has a podcast called The Big One. And in that, I couldn't find the quote to get it exact, but in it, she says, earthquake preparedness is a little bit like wearing a seat belt that it, you don't know when you're gonna get in an accident. So every time you get in the car, if you're conscientious, you put your seatbelt on. Well, earthquake preparedness and having your go bag and having a good healthy lifestyle is just like that. You don't know when it's gonna happen. Earthquake's gonna come, but when it does, if you've done your healthy lifestyle, you've got your go bag, you're gonna be ready for it and you'll have a better outcome. So that's, that's what I got. Turn it over to you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Really appreciate it. And um, thank you for reinforcing again this, this whole idea of resilience through our social connections, that the more we can reach out to one another, the more we can deepen our relationships prior to an event, the more likely yeah. we are to be resilient in the wake of an unfortunate situation. Um, you guys are great. You're doing it. Thank you very much. Well, we have a few minutes left and we want to open it up to questions. Um, so I don't see any questions in the chat, but if you have a question, you can raise your virtual hand by going down to reactions or if you can't find the reactions, you can just raise your hand on your screen if you have your if your video is on and we can see you. Any questions for we have incredible resources here this evening. <laughs> so if you have any questions for any of these folks. Okay. Um, I have a question. There's a question up on the chat. From okay. Meg, why is there so much controversy around earthquake insurance? So let's send that to Janelle. Are you still with us? I don't think so. I don't think she is. Okay. And for those who came on late, Janelle lost power and she was sitting in her car on her phone doing her presentation. Um, so Bijan, is that something that you can speak to at all? Do you have um, a perspective on that? I do not. I honestly okay. don't. I don't even have earthquake insurance on my own home. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's how much I can speak to it. Okay. Well, let me ask Woody, is that is something that you have a perspective on? Uh, I really don't, to be honest with you. And I have to confess, I don't either. Uh, my favorite cousin, who's a geologist, says that I really am on bedrock, uh, but that that may be just something I use to 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 justify. Uh, but I have to say, I, when I looked at it, was when we bought our house in '93, so lots has changed. So let's move on to another question then. Um, so Loretta asks, "Is there a shortwave radio team?" Well, we can say here um, in Marin County, there is the, uh, well, Tim, Tim, do you want to take this? Um, I can, I can, I can wing it. Um, the uh, NRG has coordinated um, uh, an effort to deploy um, family radio system radios around the, um, uh, the NRG area. And uh, we're encouraging people to uh, get those, particularly the block captains, uh, to communicate within the within the blocks and the areas that they're trying to cover. Um, we're talking, we're setting up processes at this point so that block captains can escalate or get information from a central site. We're still working on that process. In fact, I have calls with Pam about that in the future here, um, and then with the thought that a central site would be, or could communicate with, uh, with emergency sites in the, um, uh, in the area as well. I, we, that speaks very well to kind of two-way communications. And I, I should have mentioned, uh, there, so we have all the alerting systems I talked about, uh, almost all of which depend on electricity. It turns out even most landlines now 
depend on electricity. You know, the old fashioned ones that we told you, you know, don't get rid of them, they're resilient. Uh, the phone companies have now put in amplifiers and fiber optics in a lot of those systems. So something that will work uh, when the power is completely out for a long period of time, such as we experienced in uh, October of 19, are weather radios, which is sort of counterintuitive. Uh, there's some on that same emergency portal site, if you look under alerting, there's some explanation for this, uh, but you can buy for like $30 a weather radio, uh, that has a battery in it. It'll flip over to the battery if the power goes out. It'll sit there just benignly, you know, on your, on your kitchen counter, your nightstand, until we tell it to send off an alert. And this is traditionally for like, you know, tornadoes in the Midwest or something. Uh, but we can do it. We can do it for other things. And of course, when there's a, a PSPS, when they shut off the power, when PG&E does that, it's by definition in a high fire danger day. And after about four hours, most of the cell phone towers lose their backup power. Uh, so we will lose our ability to alert you of a wildfire during the time it's most likely to happen. Weather radios actually are resilient and cover most, almost the entire county. Sonoma has actually used this in three major fires uh, quite successfully. Uh, so that's not, that's a different sort of twist on radios, but I would, I would recommend that and should have mentioned it earlier. And thank you, Woody. We also have um, here in Marin County, and I have to be honest, I don't know a lot about it, but some of our block captains are members of the Marin Amateur Radio Society. These are the ham radio operators. And um, so we have, we have a number of different systems. Can I just ask a follow-up question to Woody? So Tim mentioned that we're suggesting all of our block captains get these FMRS radios. Um, the, and, and the Midlands that we are recommending have a weather channel. So I'm just wondering whether the weather channel on those radios would work with the system. You just it, it, it does, yeah. Uh, so the dedicated ones that he was referring to, will it'll receive the same frequencies. The, the difference is the things that I was mentioning that are cited on the website or some examples are, that's something you can just sit in your house and it will go off with a loud noise to tell you there's an alert as opposed to the other ones where you'd actually have to be listening to it mm -hmm. to, know, to know that there was yeah. an alert. So, you know, depending on your ability to do one versus the other. Yeah. The, uh, the nice thing about the standalone ones that he's talking about is actually I have one here and it's like every Tuesday or something like, or Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday. Uh, the thing fires off and alerts the whole house. The whole house shakes when that thing goes off. So we know that we have some confidence that one, it's working and that we will get uh, mercy information when, when it does go off. You, you can set them so you won't get the test alert, but it's it's a good thing to have. Just, I have, I have one just sitting in my office on my desk and I know it, I know it's Wednesday because yesterday I was on a conference call that was fairly uh, high stress, and suddenly this thing goes off about five inches from my uh, my headset. So, <laughs> but in any case, I, I like the fact that if that you you are listening to the Teslers and that you know that the thing is working, um, I agree in house, and that you get the household sensitive to the fact that this is something to pay attention to. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Anyone? Well, clearly our speakers were so comprehensive that they anticipated all of your questions before you had a chance to ask them. So, um, all right. Well, we wanna thank everyone who attended this evening. Thank you so much for setting this time aside and for your interest and for your um, care for our community. And thank you so much to our wonderful speakers, to Janiel, to Bijan, to Woody and to Kathy. We, we really appreciate your time and your expertise. Um, so thank you for the great questions. The recording will be on our website and that is in the chat again in a couple of days. And we hope that 
Um, some of you who are not already block captains will be so inspired by this evening that you'll want to contact us and volunteer to be block captains. And we also mm -hmm. want to, um, before we say goodnight, just a reminder that we have on the 13th of March, Sunday the 13th, which is the day we set our clocks forward, spring forward, is the Help OK Time Change Drill at 10 a.m. And those of you who have block captains, um, you'll have your help OK signs and you'll put them in the window or at the door and your block captain will come and check them. And uh, we're also excited because on Saturday, the 26th of March at the end of the month, this, this is a jam packed month for us, um, Southern Marin Fire is putting on at, uh, Elaine, is it at Tam Valley School or is it at TCSD? It's at Tam Valley School at Tam Valley School, a fire extinguisher festival. <laughs> so, um, festival might be pushing it, but fun <laughs> session, yes. <laughs> For those of us who have always thought, eh, I'm supposed to have a fire extinguisher. How do you do that? Where do you get it? For those of us who have a fire extinguisher and say, I have no idea how I use this thing. For those of us who've had a fire extinguisher for 25 years and have never moved it out of the corner in the closet where it is, this is for all of us to come and learn about fire extinguishers, get your fire extinguisher um, refilled, um, and get to see your neighbors and get out and about. So we look forward to seeing you all. Thank you very much again, everyone. And uh, be well and be safe. Thank Good you, night. Pam. And thanks, Pam. Thank this you. is great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Pam. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank Good you. night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.